Ghost of Shishima Director's Cut. The year, 1274. It's true. Apparently a lot happened in 1274. Our hero, Jin, is battling his way through the story of Ghost of Shishima when he finds out that another splinter group of the Mongol Horde has attacked the neighboring island of Iki, an island that Jin, his family, and the samurai have had experience with before. It's time to take our Kenjitsu Kenny G and his catnip-tipped katanas and four-knuckle flutes and fools into funerals. Thanks to Sony for the code, which, as you guys know, means I'll get a copy of this game and give it away to one of the watchers so my hard-earned cash is on the line just like yours. Make sure to comment if you want it, spread the video around, subscribe, hit the notification bell. You're going to see some new videos from me, more reviews this week, a ton. And more importantly, we have moved the podcast 1030 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on Fridays to YouTube Live. You guys can jump in if you want to talk about the games that have been covered. If you just want to join the group, if you want to sit down and talk about games, that is the place to come. I hope to see you there. Here's my review for the PS5 version of Ghost of Tsushima Director's Cut. Graphically and artistically, Ghost of Tsushima and the director's cut continues to impress. Though Iki is a truncated affair next to the larger island of Tsushima, you won't really notice that in your travels. Befitting of a new location are new environments, and there are some that look downright incredible. Entire locations eaten away by nature, looking almost closer to a moment in The Last of Us 2 at first than could have been expected in this game, or the location of an ancient ship battle and the secrets and the exploration there at the edge of the beach. Iki Island basks in its own unique color schemes as well, switching from an almost pearlescent rock of white cliffs to sweeping fields filled with yellow and purple, and then you dive down into the mysterious locations where moonbeams pierce through the fog that you can't see through, flitting in and out with these soft bands of white across. Ghost of Tsushima has always looked incredible, Iki does the same. There are some locations though that didn't resonate for me, like one of the main base camps you go to has this amazing battle ring, and you can have different battles with other characters in the game world. It's set on an inlet of the sea, splitting it down the center. And that location is cut down into the side of the cliffs, which immediately makes you think this is the perfect Peter Pan kind of fort for bad guys. But it's that level of detail that you normally see in other places that looks a bit bland here, showing some of the roots that the original game has when it comes to being connected to the PS4 and the PS4 Pro. Now, performance-wise, you do have that resolution and frame rate improvement here in the PS5 version, especially the resolution in some textures in some places, which is two times what you would normally see, as well as a longer draw distance that's noticeable. One thing to note is that Ghost itself looked good already uh, most of the time, and that presentation is a bit more subdued than you might actually expect. It held to the 60 FPS in this for the most part. While you can switch between the graphics and the performance mode, there isn't really enough of a difference for you to take that resolution hit. Ghost of Tsushima remains one of the better looking console games of all time. The new armor, the new weapon skins, the new locations, and a couple new enemies showcase that most of the time. Additionally, on the PS5 version, you do get the lip synced audio when it comes to the Japanese voice work. So that is something to look forward to there, which you don't get with the PS4 version. What have I done? What the Eagle wanted. Now you can tell your people the truth. How the Eagle Tribe twists our minds with fear and lies to make us their willing servants. Your journey was hard. Drink? There are easier ways to kill me. You do, when it comes to the voices, have the occasional character that slips into the not-so-Japanese villager and more-so European style of accent. But overall, everybody knocks it out of the park, including the main characters once again. Musically, however, the game has some tonal shifts I anticipated, but wasn't exactly sure if they would pull it off or even really attempt to. Now, of course, it's got the Kodo and the double read from the original game as musical instruments, but a number of the newer tracks lend a suspenseful, mysterious note to every bit of exploration that you do in the game. Now, I'm not 100% sure if the same composers worked on this. I'm going to find out in a couple days when you guys do. The director's cut in any new music that is here is tonally a perfect match. And really, Ghost of Tsushima is never a short moment from court music thunder beats laid down by some very enthusiastic drummers. It's the concept of ma, or silence and gap, that still resonates here, both within the musical tracks themselves as well as the silence between the tracks 
especially when you're exploring, which can stretch out longer than other titles and is appreciated for its uniqueness, even if at times you're like, hey, did the music actually shut off? Now, the clash of swords, the hoofbeats, a pissed off attack mayors wearing horse armor, and the throat whispers of an angry dancing Mongol shaman are also all popped out to you in various ways from the 3D enhanced audio of the headphones that you can choose and their Tempest improvements, as well as your normal 5.1, 7.1, and other audio settings. With the high number of enemies that attack you in Ghost of Shishima and now here in the director's cut, any audio enhancements are a godsend. It was already great, but there are some improvements that you will notice as you explore. And speaking of exploration, Jin basically spends most of the game tripping absolute balls. Now, I'm not going to tell you all the story. I'm going to keep most of it spoiler light. But I do want to tell you about a fourth of the way through the original story in Ghost of Tsushima, the tale of Iki Island, can be accessed. It's a mission that leads you into a mysterious battle against hardened attackers. And soon you have the option to travel to the island of Iki and help them fight off a new horde in the Mongol army. Now, it's your job to do that, to fight this new horde that's not really a new horde, it's an old horde. It's a splinter group. And as most expansions in video games go, this group is pretty much unheard of until you unlock the expansion and go forth, do some missions, help the islanders relax, doing barbecues with some music, that kind of stuff. I'll try to keep the story description light, but as I said, he spends most of the game tripping balls, which is just what you want as a dude highly trained in martial prowess, carrying a five foot sword, touching everything to make sure it's real. That is the game. While while not tonally the Brothers Grimm, the island is also much darker and more mysterious than Shoshima itself. This is an island that hates the samurai almost as much as Yen hates returning there. So much so that he has to disguise himself to even move around the natives because they would rather kill you than kill the Mongols invading them. And those are the Eagle Clan, which is everything an expansion usually presents in a brand new group. And the problem here is that there are some missteps that weren't in the original game due to the way the DLC is delivered. First, the game hinges on one of the worst parts of gaming right now, or really ever, which is visions. We all know that a character having visions, for the most part, means a character that is not in your control. And most games have done it poorly, from Far Cry 5's hilarious abductions that couldn't be stopped and then your heroin-like moments afterwards to Assassin's Creed Origins, which handled it fairly well with hallucinations in the desert. Here though, you can be in the middle of a standoff or a cutscene or battling or talking to somebody and this chick just randomly starts yakking and the graphics change. And good luck if you don't have subtitles on because you're not going to be able to figure out if anything important was actually said. When was the last time you saw somebody do a top 10 games that stole control from you completely and why it was awesome YouTuber list? Never. Visions are going to pop up while you're scouting ahead or doing something of interest only to have a character pop in to remind you that, hey, they're in control, which they absolutely are not in control. It's supposed to teach you about actions and reactions and results of terrible actions. But let's face it. The main character is a homicidal maniac anyway. That dude's well-being is an Ikea of psychologies. If one part's missing, it just falls the fuck apart and is useless. The story attempts to be introspective, and it works sometimes, but for the most part, it just confuses the perspective. Not much has changed when it comes to the combat, though, and that's good. There are some additional bits here and there I'll get to. It's still based on a light and heavy attack system with guard and parry being used depending on the enemy's attack types and the color of their attack, with some not being able to be blocked or parried. Well at least until you get the skill that allows you to do so. Four stances reflect the swordsman's adjustments to various enemy types, like those with a sword and a shield or those with a long spear. Well, that basic system and its combos with skills and abilities attached to it were the basics of Ghost of Shishima's combat. One of the core strengths was in the makeup of the enemy groups, and even that sees a change up for the better in this new expansion. The game warns you up front that the island may be a bit harder, or at least offer you a challenge, and I can say that was true. Whether that was me not having returned to the haunts of Jin in a bit of time, getting rusty, or just the new enemies, I died a couple of times before getting my feet solidly under me. And there's a couple reasons why. Firstly, are the Eagle Clan Shamans. These guys are awesome. You're battling. You're circling a dude with an axe, another dude with a giant sword, and another dude with two swords because one sword just isn't fun enough, and you notice this motherfucker in the background river dancing. When a shaman is pumping up the jams for his friends in a battle, it's surprisingly hugely impactful. I have seen games like this where they show someone you need to kill because they're buffing their friends, but this is no joke, and it can be rough to face off against a Mongol group that's backed up by Bone Thugs and Harmony Throat Singers. Think of it this way, they're anti-paladins. Their religion has basically three tenets. You have to be handy with a spear, you gotta be able to throat sing, and you need to be a wicked dancer. 
Secondly, it feels like these guys switch up their weapons way more often than the original game ever did, with characters switching between sword and shield and spear again and again in battle, and with four dudes all with different equipment and switching them, it's not unlikely there will be times where you notice one of them switching just as you're attacking, watching your weapon clank pretty uselessly off a new shield. I dug it, but they are not pushovers. Even with the new lock-on ability, they're pretty tough. By the way, that lock-on ability works well. It has a tendency to sort of look down and up through its eyebrows in a viewpoint that's always staring a bit at the ground like a Clint Eastwood grimace simulator. Another bonus here is the horse finally gets some showtime loving. Sure, you never were on Lipizzan or Stallions, but your trusty old mare was used as a springboard more than once in the original game. Here though, you can outfit the horse with horse armor and use it to smash enemies in a horse dash move that eats up resolve but can lay waste to anyone from street thugs to fully armored Mongol shield bears. And thunder hoofing it across the face of some snooty talking backward bastard in a dirty pattern printed kimono never gets old. The original game extolled the virtues of exploring the world as a wandering samurai and the combat that resulted. And while at times narratively driven, its sedate pace and world facing HUD elements led to what I felt was a more nuanced approach to world exploration and combat. You can see my original review. And this isn't that easy to actually do. Other times they feel like a weird ass solitary theme park in the middle of a field all by itself, which is scary as fuck when you think about it. This game also offers a bunch of improvements. PS5 lip syncing to the Japanese subtitles, new control schemes, haptic feedback on the PS5, those new locations, new enemies, new activities, and a couple new skills. And what's great is for the most part, all this translates over to the original game as well. So you can travel back and forth about halfway through the game that unlocks. You do have forts to take over, lighthouses to light, cat sanctuaries to play music in. It's a bit more barren though in normal combat offerings than the original game. Be aware of that. You get a couple mystic tales, a dungeon style encounter or two, a number of standoff battles and some entertaining side stories. I really liked those, but it does not feel exactly the same. And I think that lends weight to the oddity of what's going on on this island, but it's something to be aware of. And most of you are going to get it. You're going to understand exactly why it's offering something different, but be aware when you do end up traveling there, it can feel a little off kilter compared to the original game. And while the original game was an absolute blast, does that continue here? When we talk about fun, you have to look at what is offered, not only in Ghost of Tsushima at its basic core, which is a blast when it comes to combat and exploration, but also this expansion, because some people are just jumping into this brand new, some people are getting this as an add-on. The actual expression of the island itself is sound. At times, he faces arrogance, antagonism, attacks, all over Shishima, but Iki Island is just a whole new beast. It's kilometers and kilometers of hatred all packed up into a nice shippable package of terrible history and the samurai's penchant for waxing poetic as they slice and dice everyone in their way and what can happen afterwards. That combined history, the back and forth of Jin and the people he tries to help or tries to kill works wonders. It's not like he wants to come back. He'd be happy facing off in his own homeland. But if Iki falls, the rest does. Remember, this is set in the midst of the main game and is supposed to feel like a part directly injected into it. And those old stories, that motif of helping the main story along as an expansion, works well. The tidbits of those tales you find about your family and your prior dealings offer this wax paper doorway into a different societal place. And if you step through it, it can actually be a bit shocking to uncover what's happened in this character's history. Even though most of it we already knew, this new group, the Eagle Clan, helps you, well, sort of see it in the worst way possible, which is via chemical waterboarding. And it really didn't matter, even if that was happening, I was still having fun exploring, grappling, moving around the different locations, finding a secret here or there. The game itself at its base is fun, and of course this expansion does the same thing. I enjoy that combat. A couple additions that we get, some new armor, a couple new weapon items. It's the Mongol shamans that really did elevate this. The way that they adjust the entire group and how it feels is truly something that is magnificent. I know a lot of people are actually going to have a problem with it. They're not going to feel it's fair. They're going to have issues with it overall. I get that because damn, they can add difficulty to an encounter. But man, was that fun. And it took somebody like me who's played through the original and felt that they were pretty good at the game a while to understand exactly how to take them out and what to do and to prepare a little bit more than perhaps I prepared in the original game. And that brings us to the rating. There's something timely about the isolation and the wonder and that feel of Ghost of Tsushima during today's weird times. 
Did that change the review score for this expansion? No, of course not. This is a game. It's not like the fact that the world is falling to shit should reflect into the game itself. But it does give you just a tiny bit of that chaos that Jin probably feels as warring factions, sickness, and hatred overflow into everything he does, even when he tries to save people and things go wrong. I enjoyed that. I had a blast playing it. I think it is well worth getting. Luckily, even if you don't get this, you can still get a patch with a lot of the technical improvements for the PS4 and PS5, including those control schemes and the lock-on ability, which is great if you don't want to jump into this. So that's it for me. I think it was well worth getting, enjoyable. It did have some issues with the story that I feel Ghost of Tsushima did a lot better, but for this cost, this price, I think it was well worth jumping into. Anyway, that's it for me. I would love for you guys to subscribe. Hit the notification all. I promise you, you won't regret it. You're going to see more reviews this week. Next week from me, you're going to see a walk in the walk. And you can always check out the patron. It is a huge help, especially now. It's just me. No one else. There's not like 50,000 people in my team working behind me. It would be awesome if you guys join the patron. Peace out. Enjoy the rest of your week.